Guys, I hope you like my Christmas jumper. Okay. Well, I thought I'd get into the spirit, folks, and uh, I'm still the only one who's won a Christmas. Has anyone else got a Christmas jumper on? No? Well, that's slightly awkward, isn't it? So we'll press on. So, folks, we're, we're um, thinking about joy. <laughs> joy to the world, uh, which is the first line of a carol. Joy to the world. Da, da. I can't remember the rest of the words. Apparently... Oh, steady on now, folks, steady on. Apparently it's the most famous carol in um, North America. There you go, right, that's for your pub quiz, if you're doing one over... Actually, put it in the Young Adults quiz. Most famous carol in North America. Actually, ruin, I've ruined it. Get that off. Joy. Joy, joy, joy. Somebody asked me the other day, so why is it... Um, it may have been Sam Watson. I'm blessed to have some awesome people on our team who ask, uh, who ask questions quite a lot. Why, why do we do this? And um, <laughs> why do we come to church on Sundays? <laughs> Let me translate for you. Why do we come to church on Sundays? If you're from High Wycombe. So why are we here, folks? And it kind of links in with a little bit to joy. For generations, the people of God set aside a day a week called the Sabbath or Shabbat, where they would gather and they would rest to remember God's presence, and remember God's goodness, to remember his holiness, and remember that everything in life comes from him. It would remind them that that in all the, the busyness of life, in the craziness of life, it is a natural human propensity to strive And it's a natural human propensity to take responsibility and control for our own lives. So there was a day a week that started the evening, the night before, of resting and of celebrating and remembering God's sovereignty and that God reigns. And part of the day would be marked by, it sounds really like, oh, that sounds really terrible. Actually, when you read it in its context, it was a day of incredible joy. It was a day of celebration. It was a day of feasting. It was a day of fasting. It was a day to remember that God has given us good things. We may have wrecked it in the process, as humans often do, but it was a day of reclaiming what they call that Edenic state in the garden. And then after Jesus, and as the church is born, it shifts from a Saturday the Sabbath, to a Sunday, and it becomes known as the Lord's Day. Now, I've got some really geeky theological textbooks. If you want to know the precise date it shifts and why it shifts, because it's too Jewish and they want to be kind of not Jewish, become more Christian. But the idea is this, that we start the first day of the week. See, Sundays has always been known as the first day of the week, up until fairly recently. And so you would start the first day of the week and you would give that week over back to God, dedicate my week back to God in the same way that the practice was that you get up early and you dedicate your day to God, give him the first fruits of the morning. So you give him the first fruits of the week. And in a time where we live 24-7, only till, I can remember when there was a law change because I am so old that you couldn't shop on Sundays. Most of you probably don't even remember that. Look at Sam, I don't remember that. But it did happen. Oh, it was quiet. It was quiet. And so we take this moment. And at a time when, when Sunday's like the day of every other day, for us as believers, in a time when culture seemingly is far from Christianity, this is why we gather here. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, we see if we track back to the New Testament, when people would gather in churches, they'd gather in villas, there would be extended families, and you know what? Everybody would bring something. So you'd like to think, ah, Lee is going to bring a prophetic song. <laughs> oh, it's Luke, you're on son tonight. Or somebody might bring, somebody bring a, a, something they'd be thinking about, or somebody would bring something, a prophetic word, or somebody would bring something to contribute to the community that had gathered on the first day of the week to dedicate that week. And one of the markers of that time was joyful, abundant celebration and joy. 
celebrating God's presence with his people. And so in some ways, a thousand or so, 2,000 years later, not quite 2,000 years, but anyway, for the sake of arguments, there is something re- about recapturing Sunday afresh for us as we start this week, that we gather in his name on his day, that we declare who he is in song, that we, <laughs> we come before the scriptures and say, Jesus, what is it that you want to say to us today? Where, Holy Spirit, are you bringing areas of challenge in my life so that I can live for you in community with other people, seeing our city become like the eternal city to which we're going? And so that's why, Sam, we gather on a Sunday. If you want to track it back in the history of the church, Sunday has always been the day that people gather together. And one of the markers of those days is always celebrates rejoice. Do you know of all the religious systems in the world that Christianity has a propensity to for joy because one of the reasons is we sing. And we sing and we make music and some churches even dance. Now we don't have any dancing here. We ba- Steady now. <laughs> we encourage those people to go to St. Thomas's Philadelphia. All the well. They love a bit of dancing down at the well. They really do. Some people even raise their hands in worship. The crazy ones, folks. Oh, they get carried away. They really do. Because there's something about worship and celebration which is physical. So they raise their hands and they begin to to declare what God is. the, the, The notion to rejoice is to say to God, irrespective of how we're healed, this is who you are. And we are going to celebrate the truth that we find in this book, the reality of our lives, and we will declare you on the Lord's day. Wow. And you know, we've lost a little bit of that over the years, that we're now sat in pews, and people come to church, they close their arms, fold their arms like that, and go, "Ah, entertain me. Nah. Now worship leader, the other one's better. Can't tell what he says when he speaks, but this speaker's not so good. I don't like this speaker. Oof. There's another guy. It's never what it was meant to be. Became a mass. Now it's become an entertainment. And one of the things that we will do over the next years as we send out communities, recapture what it is to live out our lives in the context of community and extended family. So when we gather on a Sunday, what we're gathering is to celebrate his name, meet in his presence hear what it is he's saying, but most of all, track what it is he's doing in amongst us as a missionary community sent out to the city. That's it, folks. That's the end of the talk. Right. So we're looking at Luke chapter 15 because we're thinking about joy. And you know, Jesus has quite a lot to say about joy. Augustine of Hippo says this, that the Christians should be an alleluia from head to foot. Isn't that lovely? Celebration is that the heart of the way of Jesus. Did you know in Matthew chapter 11, verses 19, Jesus was accused of being a drunk and of being a glutton? Jesus. Now that thought assumes that somehow Jesus knew how to party. That Jesus knew how to have a good time. Partly because he associated with people who you wouldn't necessarily associate. But not only did he kind of just hang out with them and give them something, off you go. But he would actually do life with them. And actually, so much so that he would do, he had a good time. I kind of think Jesus went around with a smile on his face. In stained glass windows, he always looks a bit serious. But I wonder if in reality, there was something about a life which he shared with people that involved parting. So much so that people said he drank a bit too much wine and he ate a bit too much because he was always partying and feasting and celebrating. That was the culture of the day. Celebration and feasting was of the time. In fact, you track the Jewish scriptures, you will see feasting and celebration is a facet of religious life of the Jewish people. If you go to Israel, I've been to Israel four times. Just check in four. That is one, two, three, four. Four times, folks. Those guys know how to party. The British are not quite so up there with partying. But if we're going to capture something of Jesus, and if we're going to say we're going to be biblical folks, then we need to capture something of Jesus' heart for celebration and what he says about celebration. Think about this. We're going to look at Luke chapter 15. Now, if you've got a Bible, you're going to need it because we're going to go through it. Okay, let's look at this. He says this in chapter, um, in, 
chapter 50, verse 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. So let's just get this clear. Let's just So Jesus is saying, if one person turns back to him, there is a party in heaven. I'm just going to repeat that, because I'm not quite sure we're tracking. Let's just, so, so Jesus says this in, 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 in Luke 15, verse 7. I tell you that in my Bible, these are in red letters. You know, red letters, that's like, words that Jesus says. Oh, but how did he say? Just talk to Alan Ward. He'll explain that to you later. And the various different theories have brought about how we've got the Gospels. Okay. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So when there is a moment where somebody turns back to God recognizes their own bankruptcy, that they can't do it. We are told that the whole of heaven rejoices. Isn't that mind-blowing? And doesn't it say something about the character and nature of God? That God loves us enough? There is a moment, I think, in Hebrews. Let me just check. It's good to get these things right. Sometimes I quote them. I'm not always right. That's never good, folks. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles. We're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. The only point in Scripture where there's a kind of open in glory and that there, he says if heaven is cheering us on, it's the only point in the Bible that we see that. And in that moment, heaven rejoices when somebody turns back to God. It is joy is in the nature of God. The way that the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work together is a joyous, beautiful, life-giving thing. And if we're to look and smell like Jesus, then we need to think about joy. And ask the question, am I a joyful person? Am I celebrating joy? Am I thinking about joy? And Jesus tells us a story where we see the most amazing party and we see what can happen if we are... Well, we see as, as, as what can happen when somebody is not joyful. It's a tale of two sons, and it's in Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read it out, this whole thing. The first bit is not going to appear on the screen because I gave James the wrong uh, bit of verse, but it's going to get to 25 and he's going to put it on or Rachel's going to do it. Okay, so this is what he said. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together. All he had, he set off for a distant country and squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to feed his pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Just listen to these words. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And we, he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called out to one of his servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry 
and refused to go in. So his father went out to him and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fan calf him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So it comes to the end of Luke chapter 15 where Jesus is telling a number of different parables about what it is to be lost and what it is to be found and what it is to celebrate when somebody's found. And it says something about how some of us find celebration really hard and why we find celebrating really hard, often when we are really angry and offended. So what's the context of the story? Super quick. There's two sons. This is a rural agrarian culture, okay? They're kind of, they're farmers. And Jesus is telling a story. And Jesus is a supreme storyteller. There's a man called Elton Trueblood, who wrote a book called The Humour of Christ. And you know, he discovered that Jesus was like a stand-up comic of his day. And when you look into context, some of the stuff he said, he was a really funny guy. Which kind of ties into the sense of joy, that Jesus is probably a little more jolly than we've made him out in the church. You can have that for free, folks. So, he's telling, so, so Jesus is telling a story, at a rural, it's kind of rural, and he says, there's a bloke who had two sons, and they're like, hey, we know where this is going. One son is dead sensible, Tick, the second son, is what you call a waster. He's a party guy. And you know, there was an assumption in that culture at that time, the older son was dead sensible, the second son was less sensible. I'm not living that time, I have three kids, the eldest is dead sensible, the second one, less sensible. Okay? And so the story goes on. There's a father. He's got two sons. He's got um, the youngest son says to the father, look, I'm done with you. I want, I want my share of what's mine, and I'm off. That's like saying, oh, I'm spitting. Sorry. Sorry, Alan. It's all right. That's on behalf of Luke Graham because you called him Lee. He, said, he says, um, he says um, I, want, I don't want you, but I want your stuff. In other words, like saying, I actually wish you were dead. It, it's a bit awkward, folks. It's not very encouraging to your father. Uh, So if you don't mind uh, relinquishing all the assets, mine, and I'll have it. So the Bible says that he says that he gives him 50%, which is, he says, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. That between them means he gives him 50%. That would have really ticked off the older guy because actually he shouldn't have got 50%. So he sells up, the, he gives him the dosh. Off he goes, the story tells him. He goes wild. He has a good time. He has such a good time that the older brother at the end says he's been spending it on prostitutes. That's how a good a time he had, folks, and how his life went from pursuing a life of fulfillment and gratification, doing his own thing, and where it ended up. And where he ended up was broke. He ends up with nothing, nada. It all goes. He's bankrupt. And not only is he bankrupt, it tells us that, that, that he, he doesn't know what to do. So he, he hires himself out working with pigs. Now, if you know anything about the Jews and Jewish culture, pigs, pigs, and, uh, pigs and Jewish religion don't, they don't mix, folks. They're seen as unclean. They are, it's a symbol in which how defiled he has become. The apple has fallen a long way from the tree. Jesus is describing two cultures. A traditional culture where you get worth through your ability to conform. Or you try and get worth by carving out your own identity. And for this guy, it hasn't worked. In fact, it spectacularly failed. He ends up with nothing. He has so much money, it is a disaster. It is all gone. And it's so bad, he's feeding pigs. And it gets so bad, he's looking at what the pigs are eating. When I was in primary school, it was the food that kids didn't eat. And he's thinking, wow, that looks decent. He could well be starving, people say. It's a famine. 
He becomes a migrant. He's a long way from home. He's at the lowest point. He's gone from being really rich to being the bottom of the pile. And he makes a decision. I'm going to, the Bible says it comes to his, this beautiful word. It says it comes to his senses. And he thinks, I'd have a better life as a servant working for my old man. So he goes home. And there's this beautiful moment where the father, bear in mind, the father, in a cult, this is called an honor-shame culture, the father, wouldn't, the father by rights should have killed his son or at least beaten him with the inch of his life, but he doesn't. He loves him. He gives him what he wants, free will. You want it, you take it. But do you know the father waits for him? In a culture where no father would ever do that, the father waits for his boy. And then on horizon, he sees the disheveled character who comes along. And do you know what the Bible says? He lifts up his, he lifts up his cloak. No man, self-respecting man of wealth, would ever reveal his legs. And actually, some men, you see their legs, and you wish that we still had that culture today. But there you go. He lifts up his robe, and he runs. In fact, the Greek says it's like he falls on his neck. He's just so delighted to see his boy who he thought was dead. And he, and he, and he runs to him and, and he embraces him. And the, boy, the boy's got a, a kind of a speech. He's got a plan and his plan is, look, I, 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 I know I'm technically dead to you because I, I, I kind of said to you that I wanted your stuff but I didn't want you and now I'm gone and well how about I just come back and I'll come as a slave and I'll work out the back and I'll because I'll have a better life and and the father's like no 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 three things he does the boy comes back with bare feet that's how slaves live he gets him a pair of sandals he says no you're he restores him to sonship he gives him a ring a signet ring which means he now it's like giving him the credit card because if you've got the ring you can spend it because you've got the ring. So he's wasted everything, but he gives him the ring back and he says, there's my ring. Whatever you need, it's on me. Then he gives him a robe. And the robe is the Hebraic sign of belonging. So anybody who sees the boy in the robe thinks it's the father. It's the sign of identity. It is the sign of restoration. It is the sign of love. He screwed it up badly. And he says, and the father embraces him. And as Jesus tells us this story, it is a sign of the gospel. It's a sign of his love for you and for me. Maybe this morning was the morning after the night before. And you just wish, God, I wish I hadn't done that. And he's waiting to embrace you, to restore you to love you. And then the father has an idea. That big fattened calf. Now, the fattened calf, it's interesting about the fattened calf, is they're fat. They get big. And the idea is that you'd, you'd feed them up. I don't mean in like cages like they do in America. Sorry, sorry, Rachel. Like, I don't mean as in like, but as in there would be one set aside and it would be the focus of anticipation because it's the focus of celebration. Because when that bad boy is, <coughs> sorry for the vegans out there and veggies, and you think there's going to be a lot of burgers tonight, folks. We're going to have a lot of fun on that barbecue. Get the barbie on. You'd only do it for the, it's, it's, it, you would only slaughter the fat calf for the most amazing celebration. That's the, the only time it's for like, something like a wedding feast or something really profoundly beautiful. And, it, and this symbolizes how important it is that the boy has come home, that the father says, let's kill this one. So he does. So let's just think about for a moment that what we're told is this. Um, where is it? Where is it? I've missed it. I've missed it. 
He says this, oh, let's kill the fat calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive, was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Okay, let's just think about something. Because earlier in verse 7, what we've got here is I tell you in the same way that we were rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who are called to repent. There is something in the heart of God about celebration and feasting. Jesus starts his ministry in Luke chapter 4. Let's get them. I've got the verse again. Oh, no. Come on, Tom. Luke chapter 4. Keep them on my toes. And he says this. 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He's quoting Isaiah. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. Jesus starts his ministry proclaiming the year of Jubilee. Behold, he comes. Anyway, I'm, joking, I'm not going to go. The year of Jubilee, every 50 years, there will be a moment in Jewish life where there'll be a release, a cancelling of debts. There would be a returning of slaves. There'd be a planting no crops. Because there will be a time, a year to celebrate, to release property to its rightful owner. And it was a year of celebration. And Jesus announces his ministry, announcing a year of jubilee, that it's going to be a year of celebration. It's going to be a year of party. And so as he's telling this story of the younger brother, he's tying into that whole theme, a theme of jubilee. Do you know it's 50 years since a man called Robert Warren became the vicar of a church in Sheffield called St. Thomas Crooks? And he was an amazing man. There have been a load of amazing leaders before me. The quality has got slightly progressively less, folks. So it's all the grace of God. But he was a man who loved Jesus and loved the Holy Spirit. And under his leadership, all kind of things happened. There's one particular thing that wasn't great called the 9 o'clock service. But folks, we'll talk about that another time. But there was a great move of the Spirit. An American man called John Wimber, who was hugely influential, stood on these particular steps. There were 900 people. This is pre-health and safety, folks. 900 people in this place. The presence of God moved powerfully. It is 50 years, and it feels like part of the move of the Nehemiah Fund is saying, God, this is your church. Take this church, Lord. It's a beautiful church. There's a lot of generous people in this. Jesus, what do you want us to do in this city at this time? And it feels like we're almost in like a jubilee year. A man called Kevin Quinton, who bought a prophetic word a couple of weeks ago, he sensed that, and... It's kind of, and I was reading about the year of Jubilee that Jesus talks about. It feels like that's the right thing. Let me me tell you something about party. Psalm 126 says this, verse 2. This is when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, when he restores Jerusalem. Our mouths were filled with laughter, or laughter. Our tongues with songs of joy. When it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy carrying sheaves with them. In the hardest of times, God promises his presence. God promises his restoration. And in Luke chapter 4, Jesus begins to speak that his own time and ministry is marked by a season of jubilee. And as he tells this story, he speaks of a son who was lost and who was beautifully restored. And it was marked by a sense of celebration. Do you know, on average, children smile 400 times a day. Adults, 20. You've got to love Wikipedia, haven't you? I mean, you really have. And so the story continues. Got my place. The older brother. I feel for the older brother because I am an older brother, really. Actually, I'm not. I'm an only child, but I um, have a huge amount of sympathy with the older brother because I was never like the younger one. 
I never put a foot wrong, really. I was the older one. Lord, have you noticed all the stuff I've been doing for you? I've been grafting, God. Where are you? Look at these guys here, out in the lash. I'm not doing that, Lord. Look on me. What happens is the older brother is out grafting and he hears music. I wonder if he could smell the barbecue. Oh, that sounds like a, an Audi special by Beautiful. What if he hears the music? Da, 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 da. And he's really, really, really... It's a song. I'll tell you what it is later. <laughs> he used to sing it in the 90s, Hannah, before you were born. And on it, he hears the music, because he didn't know what it was. And he hears the music, and, and he, he's, when he hears that there's a celebration and a party, he, he's just gripped with anger. There's something about celebration sometimes that can create in us a real offence. Because there is, in celebration, freedom. You know, Jesus was the freest person that ever lived. And so he was free to spend time with people that if we spent time, we'd be filling out endless safeguarding forms. But he was free. He was free from what people thought. He was free. He experienced the most beautiful freedom of knowing the most precious connection with the Father. It's profound. And yet, when the older brother hears the party and the celebration, he is angry. This church, what is going on? And he just gets really, 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 really angry. And the thing is, when you're really angry, you often think you're right. You notice that? Something makes you angry, you often think, they've really annoyed me. And his heart is offended there's a, phrase, a saying actually by a man called John Wimber. He said, if you offend the mind, you reveal the heart. And this guy, has, his mask has been perfect for a long time. He's worked perfectly. And then it slips. His anger reveals where he's at with things. And actually what it reveals is as the younger brother is now embracing the fact that he's now restored as a son... The older brother says this. He says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. That is the heart cry of a slave, not a son. You never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He has what is known as a religious mindset. And a religious mindset really struggles with grace. And grace is this, that Jesus reaches out to us, that we cannot earn salvation. That he's gifted to us because of what Jesus supremely does on the cross. And the religious mindset thinks somehow that we have to earn and live in such a way that we get into God's good books. And if you've come here today and you think, I haven't really done enough for God, I haven't really, I haven't really checked in with him, I haven't really read my Bible enough, I would say it's a good thing to read your Bible, folks. Because, if you're, because it's the words of God. And, if you, and I kind of think, you know, it's good to, if you want to get to know Jesus, he's got a book out. <laughs> Just kind of leave that there. But if you're here because you're guilty, you haven't done this, or you haven't done this, I haven't talked to my neighbours, or I didn't find and you just come in and you think, oh God, I haven't done all this stuff. It's a bit like, do you know, that might be a little bit of religious thinking that maybe needs to give way to a new thinking, which is you are loved. You're loved. And what happens is when he confront, when the older brother confronts the party, da, 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 I don't know what song it is either. When he confronts the party and the celebration and the freedom and the abounding joy, he gets angry. Because he works really hard for God. He works really hard for the Father. 
And the father never notices him. And I've been slaving for you. You've never done any of this for me. I've never disobeyed you. Do you know the irony of that statement is? In that moment, he's totally disobeying his father. Because the older brother would have stood at the head of the banquet, giving out the best meat. And in his righteous anger, pointing out the injustice in his outrage culture, and he's cancelling the father, and he's cancelling, he is totally and utterly wrong. And reveals his own heart, which is the heart of a slave. And if you have the heart of a slave, it's always going to be really hard to get your head around joy. Because his life is not joyful. It's one of duty and of fortitude and of pressing on. And as I said this morning, stoicism, that idea that somehow you're just going to press on through, is rooted into cynicism, which means the situation will never change. And what we see in this story is the father who leaves the party and he comes to his boy. I love these words. These, these words have been some of the most healing words that I think that I've had. I have loads of him, but from the scriptures in my life. Listen to this. My son, the father says, you are always with me. Folks, the reality of joy is the presence of God in our lives in the presence of the most challenging times we can go through. My son, the father says, you are always with me and everything that I have is yours. All of us, if Jesus has encountered us, we have that robe, we have that ring, we have sandals on our feet. He is the essence of joy. If we just trust him, like a year of jubilee is about trusting him. The Shabbat, the Sabbath is about trusting him. Coming to church on Sunday, we've got a shed load of work to do because you've left it all last minute like I used to do. It's about trusting him. It's about saying, God, you will take these things. My child, the father says, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. Maybe, just maybe, if tracking with joy right now is hard, just maybe, and I say this as gently as I can, maybe because it's your heart is a little bit offended or maybe it's because there's a little bit of a religious way of thinking that has crept in and you just think God's a bit like that a headmaster my headmaster Mr Gibbons who said you kind of your effort is good but your attainment's poor He's a, he was an encouraging man he really was <laughs> and maybe that's what it feels like and so it's quite hard to be joyful in worship and look at all these people with their hands in there. I don't want to put my hands in there. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I'm just not sure I want to be here. Maybe there's a word today which is my joy is bathed in grace. And tonight we need to hear afresh, my child, you are always with me. And allow God to come and embrace you. Oh, what does that mean? Say, God, here I am. He's not going to do anything you don't want him to do. You don't want to fall on the floor and shake. He doesn't do that unless you're open to that. If you're a shake and rattle and roll person, you knock yourself out. Not, don't knock yourself out because that's a lot of risk. That's, that's a lot of paperwork, folks. I say, God, shh. one of the things the Holy Spirit does, he, he testifies to our spirit that we're from, he's our perfect father. So should we stand, folks?